The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for, <coughs> for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, this evening, turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 1. We are to uh, enjoined in Scripture to lay aside the sin nature that so easily besets us. We are vulnerable to our STA, no matter how positive we are. We have to recognize this. If we're going to thrive spiritually as believers, we have to monitor ourselves, get ourselves in fellowship, and this is glorifies God, enables you to produce divine good, and uh, at this time enables you to have capacity uh, and understanding. It's not just knowledge that's very important, that's the foundation, but it's also to be able to take the information and have understanding and to relate it to your life as a believer, not just sit in here. Uh, I'm not accusing anybody of anything. That's, that's between you and God. Uh, to merely to be even, uh, to be a hearer and not uh, be a doer by thinking, starting with your mentality, thinking and applying these things to your own Christian life. That's why these, all this information is in the Bible. It's for, it's profitable and it's for our edification and understanding. The God that these believers served is the God we serve. He is the same. He has not changed. And uh, so let's take the usual time to uh, get ourselves and keep ourselves in line spiritually, so to speak. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, great is your faithfulness. You continue to provide for us in these momentous and perilous times. But we thank you that we have the Word of God in general, and the prophetic word that lights our path and gives us great hope that we will soon be transformed fully into the image of Jesus Christ at his coming, for which we pray all the time. Bless us now in our study, in Christ's name, amen. Last time you, you might, you're supposed to, uh, by the way, the Bible says that you're supposed to meditate on these things, reflect upon what you're hearing and learning as a believer. That means you need some quiet time. And you don't have quiet time uh, when you are watching TV, playing with your phone or whatever. You need time to reflect and think about what you've learned. These believers and these things we study are an example. You may look at it and think, well, will I ever go through anything like that? Not exactly like that, but any kind of trials and difficulties that you may go through, uh, the same principles apply. And, and from last time, you, you probably, like me when you first read it, thought that the uh, thing that Cyrus did with those people that tried to frame Daniel, get him killed, right? They, were the, they weren't just getting one and get him fired. <laughs> and to Do Darius's credit, he knew what a good servant was, that, whose interest was doing the right thing. These individuals couldn't find any dirt on Daniel. None. 
And when you're in a position, a high position like that, there's all kinds of temptations to feather your own nest and to do things that aren't appropriate. But they couldn't find uh, either through uh, letting, letting th not attending to things you need to or taking a situation like so many, many do today and turn it, try to turn it to their advantage economically and otherwise. We have, a, we have governments filled with these people. Daniel wasn't one of them. He did, it, he did his job as under the Lord. And he respected the authority of his spiritual inferior, Darius, the, the Mede. So these individuals, they tried to frame Daniel they played on the king's approbation by saying, let's make a decree that everyone has to, uh, cannot, cannot call upon any other God, et cetera, et cetera, uh, for, for a specified period of time. And he signed off on it. He had no idea that they who brought this to him were up to no good, attacking uh, someone who was a great asset to Darius. So, it may seem extreme, but they tricked him. It wasn't above board stuff. Let's just set aside some time for everybody in the kingdom to honor, uh, to just honor him. It, it's not a good idea, but the thing is, he thought they were on the up and up. They weren't. Though those that joined into that, spying on Daniel, trying to turn over every stone to find, find some dirt to, to, to bring before the king. They couldn't. So they made this whole thing up. So now it doesn't seem so harsh what he did. They were trying to take everything, take Daniel's life, shut down everything. So what do they get? They get what they were trying to do to Daniel and had everything that was dear to them wiped out by a bunch of hungry lions, their families, everything. When he realized that they did this for this reason and this reason alone, not to honor him, but to get to Daniel. And so Daniel obviously walks away from this test of being with the lions. Now da Daniel had a Daniel had a history and a background. He'd been he'd been he'd been in, in Babylon all these years. He'd seen it all. He saw his friends being delivered. He had vision. He, he interpreted dreams of, of Nebuchadnezzar. Even one that was very unpleasant to him. The one about the tree. That in the, in the vision uh, that, that Nebuchadnezzar saw that grew up and could be seen from any vantage point on the face of the earth. He had all this behind him. He had all this history. I think these three fellows, when they were taken against their will, but they recognized it was the will of God that overruled all this, and they're, 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 they're just going to be another some court people, and Daniel gets promoted over all the wise men and everything in Babylon. Once he, once he uh, uh, helped Nebuchadnezzar with his, the dreams that troubled him, that he didn't understand. So he, he comes down to this point in his, in his, in his, older, in his much older age. So, 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 so he, he's like steel. He's completely relaxed. And his God delivered him. And this was a monumental witness to everybody at that time who heard about it. And then, so the king sends out this, this deal. You, can't, you cannot 
uh, badmouth the God of Daniel. See, these Nebuchadnezzar and Darius, they knew that the Jewish nation had been uprooted. And as Daniel you know, would pray three times a day facing Jerusalem, that's in ruins. Nobody, no Jews are in the land. It's just laying there for all that 70 years. He had doctrine in his soul. He knew there was a future for Jerusalem. And this wasn't the end game. This was just a pure, uh, an event that would occur. And later in the book, in nine, he's, he's, how he got it, I don't know. These are little questions I would ask people. How'd you get a hold of that? He got a hold of Jeremiah's prophecy. He got a hold of the book of Jeremiah. Somehow it was delivered to him. Of course, by the time this was happening, the Jews had settled into Babylon. Those that had been survived and were brought into captivity. They were settled in the Jewish quarter, setting up businesses and all the rest of it. And, and, and the Persian, they, they, they weren't trying to shove their religion down their throat. That's one of the things about the Medes and the Persians. They did not, they did not restrict people from their own cultural religious beliefs as long as they were law-abiding and functioning in the kingdom. They didn't do that. They were very liberal-minded in that department, that good, good kind of liberal-minded. Let people do their thing. When, when they conquered areas, they didn't, they didn't try to force the Persian religion on them. And so Daniel's studying the book of Jeremiah, and he finds out something he didn't know. He finds out that the time frame for the Jews before they could go back and reestablish themselves in the land would be 70 years. And of course, he has enough sense to know when, they, when, the, when that group of Jews were brought there, 586 B.C. He knew when they were headed home, 516 And he was praying in that chapter nine and got the doctrine of the Daniel 70 weeks of years. Anyway, I just want to review. This is just sort of a, we, we went through it in detail, but you always have more insights. More insights and you see, and you see personality, uh, personalities of the different people. Daniel was a witness and he didn't have to do anything but Okay, I'm going to be putting a lion's den or whatever. He comes walking out of there. Probably went and took a shower. I would. <laughs> you know? I mean, and it, it, you can imagine how strong his faith was. And these three men, when, these three fellows, when they were brought as older teens into captivity, and they were going to serve in the king's court because they handpicked these type people because they were, one, attractive. They had something going for them. And then they would train them and, and what they needed to do in the court for the king. Daniel got promoted over all the college system. Every time you turn around, he's got getting promoted. And then he gets demoted. But it doesn't bother him. He goes, he goes with it. Once Nebuchadnezzar dies, Daniel is basically put over on the shelf and forgotten. Until the very end of the Babylonian Empire came and the handwriting on the wall in this big party room where they're hell raising like crazy. The king, who was corrupt, this one, this last one, he goes into the temple, he goes into the Babylonian treasury, their temple, because temples were treasuries, banks, if you will. He went in there and got the golden vessels, cups, 
solid gold cups that they had confiscated from the Jewish temple and brought there. And he brought them into this place, sacrilege. He brings them into this place and starts toasting the gods of Babylon, filling them up with wine, drinking, toasting the gods of Babylon. Well, the handwriting on the wall said it was over for you, buddy. It's over. No, none of the other people could interpret this. The revelry of the party went south. Everybody was stunned because a singular hand came up on that stone wall and, car and chiseled in the fact that, that, that you've had it. And of course, nobody was going to say that. Nobody could interpret him. But the queen mother was still alive. Nebuchadnezzar's queen mother, elderly. And she tells that final king, we got someone that served Nebuchadnezzar. And he's, he, he, he's the one that can unravel this. And they brought him in there, you know, and he told them what it was. He told them this is the end. And the, and the king, he, he's so screwed up. He wants to give him a bunch of gifts. He's, keep them. I don't want your stuff. And turned and walked out. And before the night was over, everybody and all the princes and this king and every one of them, they had been killed by the commandos that came into the city and went into the, that place and they cut the head off of the, of the Babylonian and, sit, and everyone got up the next morning, you're being ruled by the Persians, go about your business. And because of that Persian mentality, the Jews, any peoples that had been taken into captivity and, and, and taken out of their countries and put in Babylon and the area, they were allowed to go back to their homeland with some restrictions. For the Jews, the restriction was you can't rebuild the city. You can go build your temple. And it was later down the line that a Persian monarch allowed them to build up the fortification of Jerusalem. And where's Babylon today? That city, it's an archeological ruin in Iraq, close to Baghdad. Where's Jerusalem? She has her ups, she has her way downs and her ups, but her final, her final up is, you know what it is. The center of royal rule over this earth under Jesus Christ. She's gonna go through some real difficulties before she gets there, but Jerusalem will survive. It is the city, it is God's favorite, piece of real estate on the face of this earth. It's in a psalm. Okay, enough on that. I, I, I think, Dan, I, I, no, it isn't enough. I changed my mind. The, Daniel's witness about his God. I wonder how many converts, literal converts, uh, it, uh, it resulted among the Persian population. That'll be curious, won't it? It's pretty clear to me that Darius was one of them. And that's quite a transition when you're raised up to believe a certain thing and then you turn and say, here's, you know, here's these defeated uh, Jews who have been deported and are held captive in Babylon. It's quite a thing to say, their God's the real deal. But not all these kings ever acted that way in spite of the evidence. We were on the point believers are to obey the authorities established by divine institution number four insofar as we are not asked to or required to deny our faith in any respect or regard. I don't know if you'll need this someday. I don't. I don't know if they want, if they want to impose something on believers or people in general that we can't abide by. <clears throat> I read, I don't know if they, they've, they've instituted it yet or they're working on it or it's actually 
in operation. In Brazil, if you don't take the shot, you can't get your welfare. Now that is just hurting poor people. So that government must be run by Illuminati types. Things I, things I come across, and I don't, I'm not necessarily looking for them, it's just them, some of the things God shows me. If you uh, didn't get to hear Putin's speech before all these dignitaries, I got it, I can send it to you via email. I sent it to several of you uh, this, this evening. So look at your email. You ought to hear the speech. He, he calls out this country in the West for cor their corruption. And the main thing he focuses on is sexual perversion. It's not the only thing, but it's the main thing. To me, it was the, one of the main things that came through. That we are authorizing and promoting sexual perversion with children, same-sex marriages, and the rest of it. And this is Russia. This is Russia calling out. It was suppressed in the West. You didn't get it in your evening news, did you? There would be a, any number of Americans would agree 100% we're doing this unless they're just so blinded by some stupid patriotism they can't see straight up. And there's those types. Things sure do shift. All right. Here in this chapter. And we will begin with uh, verse 15. Now this has to do with uh, the oppression of the chosen people. And after Joseph passed from the scene and all that generation, you remember the Jews went down to Egypt, right? There's no accidents. This was, this was, this was gonna be a haven for them. This wasn't the time for them to occupy the land. When they went to Egypt, they had 70, 70 Jewish souls that went down there, men and women, children. That's it. It's not a very big number, 70. They went to Egypt and because of Joseph and his dynamic as a believer and the Pharaoh liked him just like Darius liked Daniel and he promoted him and gave him unlimited authority over Egypt. And when his, due to a famine in the land, and, and the whole story is in Genesis, how, how eventually they got down there and they got the choicest real estate. Because the Egyptians practiced segregation. And this was good, a good thing, that the Jews would be up here in their area doing their thing and they began to prosper. God started blessing their reproduction. They increased in number. In verse 7. So that the land, that's Goshen, that is the northeast delta region. Up on the north side. East of the Nile River. They got the choicest real estate in all of Egypt. The chances of that are nil, except one dynamic believer who went to Egypt as a slave. Joseph, persecuted by his brothers, taken off to Egypt, and we've seen how he was promoted and then he would be demoted. But his final promotion out of a prison 
and he was given the keys of the kingdom, the Egyptian kingdom. And Egypt was prospering like crazy. And the nations in the, in, the, in the Middle East and around that area, in the Med, they were going through extreme drought. And they were bringing their, their hard cash, their hard coin. They were bringing it down to Egypt to buy grain. Jacob had sent his sons down there and pretty well used their stash up. And then when uh, uh, Jacob, Jacob realized he'd been deceived, but he didn't scream and yell at his sons like a lot of people would do. He realized he wasn't, wasn't objective about Joseph. He was schizophrenic. Joseph's great, but Joseph doesn't know what he's talking about. And these dreams rebuked him for them. You got you to gotta know what it's like to have a breakthrough doctrinally and then to have people rebuking you and telling you, oh, you're wrong. I've been there, done that. You just, what you do is you just plow ahead. It's the truth and you just, God stands by it and you let, let people do what they're going to do. So they came into the land and uh, they, they became exceedingly mighty so at the land, that's area. It was, it was a population explosion among the Jews. God was blessing their reproduction. Uh, uh, it wasn't a bunch of babies dying. It wasn't a bunch of uh, sterile females. Boom, boom, boom. And another Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph. He knew who Joseph was. He didn't recognize his greatness and that he did, he because of his God, delivered Egypt. Because Egypt was under the famine too. But because of Joseph, they were able to store up granaries filled with grain to get through that, that bad seven years. So this king does what all corrupt rulers do, promotes propaganda maligns the Jews. Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. That isn't necessarily true. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. Oh, come on. And people bought this. Just like people buy the propaganda that's being put out in this country today. They bought it. Get everybody under fear. These Jews are going to turn on us and their numbers are growing. And they're going to, they're going to if there's any invasion from any nations coming in, they'll join up with them, blah, 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 blah. And the Jews had done nothing to indicate that they were anything but loyal subjects down there. So he appointed taskmasters over them, verse 11, to afflict them with hard labor. They suddenly went from one day to the next, and guess what they were? They were not independent, doing their own business, running their own shops and, and, and artisan things. They, they were suddenly shut down and put on work projects for the glory of the Egyptian pharaoh and so forth. Hard labor. What's the idea? If we put them under this, this will, this will slow down the population explosion. Because they'll, they'll be too tired. This, this, will just, this will just slow, they'll be demoralized. Well, it didn't work because of their God. And they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. Babies, babies, babies. And the more they spread out so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to, to labor rigor, rigorously. 
and made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and brick and all kinds of labor in the field, all their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. You, you wouldn't even tr treat regular slaves like that. They treated them like that. Backbreaking work, long hours in the hot Egyptian sun. And that's what you came home to every day. And just crashed. And had to get up by sun, sun up and be, be back on out there. Probably seven days a week. No reprieve. So, in spite of that, the population explosion part of it just continues to go. They, they don't let them make wealth anymore. You can't, you can't make anything. You can't, you can't, you know, run. So then it comes to this. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. One of them was named Shipra and the other was named Pua. And he said, when you are helping the Hebrew women to give birth and see them upon the birth stool, if it's a son, then you shall put him to death. Oh, really? I might have misrepresented this last time. These are Egyptian mid, uh, these are Hebrew midwives. I'm, I misspoke, I apologize. You'll put them to death, but if it is a daughter, then she shall live. Oh. And asking these two Hebrew women to kill babies, newborns. But the midwives feared God. That's the saving grace right there. I fear God. And, and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. So the king called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and let the boys live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, now I don't know if this is true or not, or if it is an exaggeration. Not, 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 not telling the complete truth. Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. I guess they, if there was just two midwives, they were really <laughs> busy. That's what he, that's, they walk in and tell the Pharaoh this. So God was good to the midwives. And the people multiplied and became very mighty. And now he'll take another ta tactic. It's in this climate that Moses was born. Because the midwives feared God, he established households for them. I guess they were unmarried women. I guess God provided a, 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 a right man for them. I'm assuming they were, would be young, young, young females, then for, but, so he established households for them. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born, you are to cast into the Nile and every daughter you shall keep alive. He keeps this genocide going. Cast into the water means specifically the Nile. So, it, so his police or his goon squad would go out from Dwelling place to dwelling place, looking for babies, boys. If you were of a certain age, you were, you were beyond a certain age, I don't know what it was, you were okay. But they're getting the youngest of the young. And say, you are to take them, and this is the decree, take them and throw them in the Nile and drown them. And I'm sure a lot of Jews lost, lost a, a baby boy or, or more to this kind of evil. Oh, this kingdom is asking for it, isn't it? I mean, it's like God said to Abraham, those who bless you, I will bless, and those who curse you, I will curse. 
And so when this thing all wraps up, Egypt is a shambles. When Moses comes of age spiritually and comes back and the plagues, it wrecked Egypt. Brought it to its knees and then Pharaoh's armies wiped out at Red Sea. Drowned, how fitting. All these men. You do not touch the apple of God's or the pupil of God's eye. You do not persecute the chosen race. If, if a Jew is a criminal and evil, and the, God knows there's plenty of them are, they have a mafia. They have, they have international bankers. They have, you know, they have this. They run the porn industry out in California. They're the top people in it. That doesn't change anything. God will deal with them as individuals who are corrupt. And so should any government. If it was criminal activity, you, you, you just deal with them. So, this leads to the birth of Moses. And uh, uh, of the tribe of Levi, married the daughter of Levi, Putin in his speech says, marriage is a union between a man and a woman, and all the holy books of all the nations say this is the case. But the West says it isn't. The top people in the West, not just some weirdos in the street, pointing out this country and Europe too, because he said the West in general terms. He didn't say U.S. specific, but he, but he, he, he said this, 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 whole, this whole thing is evil. Uh, and she saw that he was be, uh, beautiful. She hid him for three months. He's a little tiny thing, so she's hiding him in different places. This is the test of Moses' mother. She's hiding her baby boy. But when she couldn't hide him any longer, during the daytime, that's when they'd come looking for him. She hid him in a wicker basket, covered it with tar and pitch, see, so it'd be waterproof. Put the child into it and set him among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. The reeds that grew up would, would, would be camouflage. That's what she had to do with her baby boy. During the daytime, when he needed X, Y, Z, and just leave him there but God's watching over him. And she had a sentry to watch out. His sister, her name's Miriam, stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. So that's what she did day after day. She was like, she was like at this time, she was like 12 years old. Miriam. She's the oldest in the family. And then there was another brother mentioned later, Aaron. Anyway, all right, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Believers are to obey the authority structure, point seven, within the inst societal institutions of which they are a part, business, academic, military, athletic, etc. They are to obey the, their authorities in this regard. We have a series of scriptures from the New Testament that tells, uh, tells believers that they are to be obedient. Uh, whatever uh, line of work they're in, uh, whoever their boss is, their authorities over them. Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. A lot of slaves in the Roman Empire, and a bunch of them became believers. These are people from other countries who were the slaves as a result of Roman conquest. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, and fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not but by way of eye service, showing off, as men pleasers, but slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will render service as to the Lord and not to men, 
knowing that whatever good that each one does, this you will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Uh, so that was, that was a specific category we don't have to deal with, uh, specifically of, of that extreme situation. Again, slaves and Colossians, in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Keep occupied with Christ and you're doing this as unto him. You're not doing it as unto your slave master. Yes, he told you to go out here and do whatever it is, your, your chore or your niche is, you go do it. But, you're, but in your mind, I'm doing this as unto the Lord. And I'm not going to resort to any of the usual things that slaves resort to. Sucking up to somebody, men pleasers, things of that nature. None of it. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as the Lord, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Okay? And so forth and so on. So be obedient even if the order is not the best way to go about it. Do not argue, Titus 2.9. Do not pilfer. Slaves are tempted to take little things and then they walk off. Well, it's just a pencil. I, oh, they didn't have pencils, but I mean, it's just, it was just a couple pencils I, I, I took from work or whatever it was, about, you know, that kind of stuff. That's pilfering, a form of stealing. They'll never miss it. That's not the point. Uh, if, you work for, if you work for believers, if you have a job and you're working for a believer, don't take advantage of it because you're a believer. Uh, do your job as unto the Lord and uh, this is in, uh, sorry about that. Uh, don't take I, get, I went the wrong direction, excuse me. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.2. Uh, Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them. That's a believer, so I can, they got doctrine, they got, you know, because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. <coughs> So don't take advantage of your boss uh, in your workplace uh, because you're a believer. Take whatever undeserved suffering comes your way, knowing the Lord will reward you. He will not put you through more than you can handle, and he will deliver you in one way or another. All right, I'll let you go. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us in Christ's name.